Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to my raid guide to the Dalryada, the new large-scale raid introduced in patch 5.55. To access the Dalryada, you'll need to progress the Save the Queen side story quest until you reach the exploration zone, Zadnor. Once you hit resistance rank 25, finish all the story quests up to this point, you'll be good to go. It respawns every hour, but completing critical engagements in Zadnor will speed up the respawn, so it really feels more like 30 minutes most of the time. It drops field notes for the lore on the foes inside, which you'll need for an achievement mount in case you're looking for that. There's orchestrian rolls and mithril and platinum coins. These can be exchanged for several different rewards, most notably the item level 525 armor sets modeled after several key Final Fantasy XII characters. The Dalryada also scales dynamically, granting players a powerful echo buff if fewer players are present. Seriously, we 8-man this on day one mostly with ease, despite it supporting up to 48 players itself. Just know that with very few people, you can disrespect a lot of mechanics, but with 48 people, they're going to be a lot more threatening. We'll be properly stating how to do mechanics here, not just lol I did it with 8 people ignore everything mentality. The raid itself is broken up into several major sections. To skip to a specific one, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. At the start of the raid, assign one group of 8 or less individuals to interact with these star chasers that are to the left when you enter. These will take the players who use them to an alternate first boss that must be pulled and defeated alongside the boss the rest of the raid is dealing with. Fortunately, there's no need to coordinate kill times here. Just coordinate a pull time and either side can take all the time they need to defeat their respective bosses. If you're doing this with very few people, consider sending something more like four or five people to deal with the boss that is through the Star Chasers. It's way less threatening and way less time consuming than the boss the rest of the raid will be doing. So first, let's cover the Star Chaser team. They will face off against Sartevois, whom is largely similar to his appearance in the Southern Bojjan Front. Pyrokinesis is room-wide damage here, but it doesn't do that much. Keep in mind Sartevois phases based on HP quite frequently, and even with half-decent DPS, you probably won't see most of what I'm going to tell you in this guide. His first mechanic is Time Eruption, which you should have seen many times over by now. Stand on the slow rotating clocks first, wait for the first explosion, then quickly move off of them. Sartavon does also have access to Reverse Time Eruption here, which asks you to do the opposite. You want to stand on the fast rotating clock first, and then move into the slow ones after they explode. Now in some groups, that's literally all I see, but there is a decent bit more to him if you're in a slower kill speed. He can summon two rows of phoenixes that all do dive bombs across the arena, which you just need to avoid all of their paths. There's Thermal Gust line AoEs that he aims at random players. Grand Cross Flame, which is just a giant cross AoE that he'll do from his location. And then he can even summon Meteor Markers, where you just need to have one person stand in each of them and you'll be fine. Around 55%, Sartival will go to the center and do multiple back-to-back -back roomwide AoEs that the party needs to heal through. He then transforms into this giant hulking fire elemental with a blade. When he's in this phase, Burning Blade is a tank buster, so watch out for that. Shortly after Burning Blade is Mana Thaywan Flame, however that's pronounced. This does damage to all players and summons several X-Blades at a few of their positions. It's best to have the party stack up and try to face the same direction during this to place and aim most of these X-Blades together. After a short delay, the X-Blades do a large point blank AoE and a fire line AoE in the direction that they are facing. So you want to get away from them and don't be in front of them either. It's not too bad even if you just kind of wing it. After this is left or right brand, this just cleaves half the room based on the direction the boss is facing, so just get to the other side. Then you got double cast, which is just four spread AoEs and one split damage AoE, nothing fancy. After this, he can start using more of his phase one attacks. You'll see phoenixes, time eruptions, meteors, and pyrokinesis. We had to try to barely DPS him here, and we still barely saw some of this stuff, so halfway decent DPS, you won't see most of it. After defeating Sartavoa, you'll just AoE down adds until the other team is done. You can even choose to just like leave one ad alive and not kill it and then no more will spawn and you can just slash sit and wait for the other team. On the flip side, the remaining members of the raid are contending with three mini bosses back to back at the main entrance. Each of them is modeled after critical engagements you've been doing in the zone and previous zone, so they should all look familiar. The first of the three mini bosses is the 4th Legion Blackburn. It's exactly like one of the Zone 3 CEs that is in the zone, but even easier. Now, it's worth noting that you can bring the burst action here to abuse his magic aversion and increase his damage taken. Various bosses have physical or magical aversion, and the rampage and burst actions just basically make those bosses take 10% more damage. So if you're not sure if anyone else has it, it's always a good idea to maybe consider bringing it yourself. Other than that, the boss doesn't really do anything of note. Suppressive Magitek Raise is a room-wide AoE, and the boss doesn't even have a tank buster. He has anti-personnel missiles, which places several of those back-to-back -back square AoEs you've probably seen in other content. You just gotta dodge the first one that appears, and then find safe spots for two and three. 
The only mechanic the boss really has is field support. This summons a full line of soldiers along the wall and then another partial line of soldiers along an adjacent wall. You'll get a weak point marker and you just need to make sure that the open side is hit by the undodgeable line of AoEs while avoiding the partial line altogether. Then you just group up and AoE all the infantry that spawns with burst again being a fantastic option. Blackburn then just goes back and forth between doing surface missiles, which just drops baited AoEs on the ground, and room-wide damage. Pretty much all three of the mini-bosses do this after they've exhausted their mechanics, they'll just spam dodgeable stuff and unavoidable raid damage. So after you get to this, finish him, and then you'll be on mini-boss number two. The second mini-boss is against an Augur. It just has Sanctified Quake 3 as a room-wide and once again no tank busters of note. His first real order of business is Void Call, which replicates the mechanics from the On Serpent's Wing CE in Zadnor. One Serpent will do a pushback, one will cast Water Donuts on players, and the rest will do point blank AoEs. Ideally, you stack everyone up and then stay stacked after the knockback, dead center of the donut, to make sure no one gets hit. If you've got trust issues or you want that uptime, Arms Length and Surecast work on the knockback and you can just hit the auger the whole time. And if you really don't trust anyone, Reflect technically works on the magic damage that comes out of these various adds. After this, all the adds swarm the party, but just have a tank pick it up and AoE it down. Now the boss will still do Pyroplexy, which puts meteor markers that require one player in each of them to mitigate the raid-wide explosion. You can miss one or two of these and it's not too bad, but you really just don't want to because the Vuln stacks are going to get quite noticeable pretty quick. After that, just clear out all the ads, survive some spammed room-wide AoEs, and you're on to mini-boss number three. The final mini-boss is Alkanost and Carrion Crow, which actually use mechanics from the Shadow's Hand CE in the Southern Front with a slight twist. The first mechanic is Storm Call plus Winds. The Crow will summon a knockback from a side of the room, while orbs summoned by Alkanost float towards the wind wall that is to the south. When the orbs reach the wall, they do a massive explosion, so you need to make sure you're away from them while doing whatever the knockback is asking you to do. Where to stand is going to vary based on where the knockback is actually coming from. If you'd like to just only think about dodging the orb explosions, arms like the Shurkaz work here if you still have it. After this, Alkanos will summon clones similar to the Sophia battle. When Alkanos casts either a Conal AoE, a Donut AoE, or a Point Blank AoE, he will tether to two of the clones, commanding them to copy his attack when the time comes. He'll do this twice back to back to make sure all four clones actually have something to copy. After issuing commands, the Crow will do a knockback. The goal is to be knocked back into an area that's safe from all of the clone AoEs. Now this can play out a couple of different ways. There's one where there's two giant point blank AoEs and two donut AoEs, and for that one you'll want to be knocked back to being under one of the donut AoEs. The other variant has a conal AoE and a donut AoE, and for that you'd want to be knocked back behind the one doing the conal AoE. Simple. If you don't trust it, arms like the sure cast if you haven't used it yet. After this, Crow and Alkanos will just alternate between several AoEs. The Crow will use a giant 180 degree box AoE, while Alkanos does some point blank AoEs, donut AoEs, and a room wide AoE. Clear out these last two pets, and once both teams are done, you'll be past the first encounter. The team that defeated Sartavaugh should advance to the next room and make sure they hit that switch, because the team outside can't advance until they do. Well, technically you're past the first encounter. There is a trash mob you'll need to clear out before getting to the chests and to the second boss. Apparently, there can actually be up to three chests here, though most groups only see two. In fact, as of this video, I've never seen three chests here. So as of this video, the speculation is that it's either based on kill speed or having nobody die in either of the encounters. But either way, just expect to get two here for the time being and anytime you're with pugs. And now we're on to the second boss with Kukulin, who's a very simple boss. Purified Soul is room-wide damage, and Might of Malice is his tank buster. The first mechanic is Burgeoning Dread, which is just Force March. Nothing special here, just try to avoid letting it walk you into any of the four sludge pools you see around the map. You'll need those for the next mechanic. After the boss re-centers himself and does another room-wide AoE, he will cast Fleshy Necromass. This causes him to bounce on the party wildly, randomly, stunning, damaging, and giving Vuln Snacks to anyone hit. You can mitigate this attack entirely by touching one of the sludge puddles to become a slime. This reduces it to a minor stun and prevents any major effects from occurring, and then once he's done, just go back to attacking him. After this is honestly just a bunch of AoE combinations. Necrotic Billow drops a ton of baited AoEs on players that you need to dodge. Ambient Pulsation summons three sets of AoEs. You'll ideally want to stay in the middle of the room until you see the third set of AoEs appear, and then go to that side of the room. Once the first set explodes and the center is safe, then dodge into the middle. The only other major attack to worry about potentially is Ghastly Aura. 
This causes everyone in the room to be misdirected. The little pointer over your head that lets you only move in the direction it's facing when you start moving. This will just be combined with another attack, like Fleshy Necromass or Necrotic Billow. So if you get this plus Necromass, then you have to guide yourself into the puddles in order to transform. If you get that plus Necrotic Billow, then you need to make sure you're dodging the AoEs with it. I wouldn't be surprised if you can get Ambient Pulsation here too. I never have, but I wouldn't be surprised. Either way, it's just those mechanics with misdirections, so as long as you do that, you've won the second fight. Now the third section is going to require some coordination. You'll need one team to go down both the east and west hallways and clear out all the mobs in them. There are a number of hazards here, including alternating laser grids that deal massive damage and paralyze if you walk through them, a giant laser that fires from the opposite end of the hallway with a huge knockback effect and damage, and a most deadly electric floor that deals percentage-based health damage as you stand in it. Fortunately, we can mitigate two of these three hazards. Now you need one party to stay behind in the first room. There's a platform of four glowing squares that requires four players to stand in it. The players can stand anywhere on the platform, it doesn't have to be in the specific squares, but you do need to have them stand in it because that will turn off the electric floors in the hallways. For mitigation number two, the monitors in the front of the room are indicators of where the lasers will be firing down the hallways. The two left monitors cover the left hallway and the two right monitors cover the right hallway. You want to use shout chat to communicate from this room what the two hallway teams need to be dodging. It's very popular to call the safe sides by typing things like LR for left and right or all left or all right to alert the teams. You have tons of time to alert them, so as long as you're communicating to them at all, you shouldn't have a problem. Just remember that yell chat actually has a range and the teams will likely outrange it shortly into the hallway, so definitely use shout chat even if people in the zone start complaining. The team that does stay behind in that middle room will still have to contend with ads, by the way. So make sure you leave a tank and healer behind and do your best to stay on those platforms. If you need to dodge an AOE, you can step off of them for a second, but you're just gonna be doing damage to teams that are in the hallways themselves. So get right back on them and make sure the range do not leave that platform. Other than that, the ads don't do anything special. Just a bunch of aimed AOEs. There's magic bits that shoot line AOEs at the people on the platforms, nothing fancy. Now it's just on the hallway teams to be patient with the laser grids and clear out all the mobs. At the end of the hallways are buttons that need to be pressed. You're supposed to press them at the same time, but when you beat your hallway, just start spam pressing it. And when the other team is ready, they'll start pressing it and it'll be fine. After this, this will open up doors into a new room, including a hallway for the people back in the middle room to just skip right through without having to run down the side hallways themselves. There will be one mob waiting for you, a Colossus mob that just does like a rotating slash, but you can deal with that. Now you're on to boss number three. This encounter will begin against Sonyan, a giant robot with some pretty basic attacks. It's really just a tutorial phase to show you how his attacks work. High-powered Magitek Ray is a tank buster, Magitek Halo is a donut AoE, and Magitek Cross Ray is a cross AoE. Sonyan's main gimmick is that he will place arrows under himself and after a short delay, slide the AoE over to a new location. If it's a donut AoE, just follow the slide and stay under him, whereas if it's a cross AoE, just make sure you're not wherever the cross is going to end up. The only other mechanic for phase one is Missile Command, which just summons a bunch of baited and targeted AoEs before ending with a stack marker. I say that's all else because that's all I've ever seen him do. I wouldn't be surprised if he can use some of his phase two mechanics, but I have never seen him do it, so that's all I can say. Around 35%, Sonyan will become untargetable and Dewan the Younger will join the fight. A different tank should pick it up and just move it slightly away from Sonyan as they do get a buff for being too close when they aren't performing mechanics, but you don't have to go that far. Caster should actually stay on Sonyan, by the way, as he is weak to magic with magic aversion, and they basically have a shared health pool at this point. There's no need to time your kills or speed or anything, just kill them and you'll be okay. They'll share health with each other occasionally anyway. The first combination attack here is the sliding Magitek AoEs and Dewan's Wildfire Winds. This is exactly the same as Dewan's AoEs in Lacus Latori, the one that spawned the orbs and the plumes and some were donuts and point blank AoEs. The lighter plume looking orbs are donut AoEs, making them safe spots. Make sure to do the sliding AoE first and then either find a donut AoE or an open space to avoid the follow up explosion. This is then followed up with Missile Command and Dewan jumping away and doing a donut AoE. You're going to want to spread, dodge, then stack for the split damage, and then be ready to follow Dewan after he uses Swooping Frenzy because that will be followed up with the Donut AoE. Their other major combo is Obey plus Spiral Scourge. Sonyan will teleport away and form a line on the ground, designating a path he will use for his next attack. 
When Spiral Scourge finishes casting, he will begin to spin and slowly move along the path, massacring anything in his way. At the same time, Dewan will use Obey with three different jump markers, which is again the same as Lacus Latore. The only catch here is that one of his donut AoEs will be at a location that Sonyan is currently charging through. You'll need to identify that spot and exercise a bit more patience before going into the donut AoE. Once you've figured out which one it is, follow behind Sonyan until you are safely in the correct spot to do Obey. Now, most of the times I see this, it's on the first or second Obey when either of them is a donut, but it's never on more than one. I will also say, keep an eye on all three obeys. It can be Donut Donut Cross and Donut Cross Cross. I've seen a ton of people just go to the third spot thinking, oh, it's a Donut AoE, only to get a very rude awakening. After this, you'll get Swooping Frenzy, a Conal AoE, and Missile Commands before both bosses use Tank Busters on their tanks. For Dewan, his Tank Buster is called Tooth and Talon, by the way. The final combo attack is Spiral Scourge plus Wildfire Winds. This one is a bit easier than the previous. The first Wildfire Wind, you just kind of dodge it as normal. It's very rare that you'll be in Sonyan's path while he's charging. For the second one, you're going to need to try to find a safe spot that he isn't actually charging through. That can be deep in a corner of the arena, or you can just get behind him and find the first donut or safe spot that's available. Either way, this one you can wing pretty safely, unless of course you're worried about losing uptime, in which case really hope the tank isn't winging it. After this, their combos just repeat until you defeat them both. With that, you'll unlock the final boss room. Pretty lengthy cutscene here, so be sure to ask if there are any newcomers that need a moment. Oh, and grab that loot chest. The final boss is the Diablo Armament. This combines attacks from the original Diablos encounter with some more Ultima weapon style attacks as well. His tank buster is Advanced Death Ray, which is a line AoE towards that actual tank. So that tank should just get close to him and move to a side when they see this so they don't murder everyone. Etheric Explosion is his generic room-wide AoE, but a lot of his attacks do room-wide, so don't just look out for that one. The first mechanic is Etherochemical Lasers. Diablo fires two back-to-back -back AoEs, one a line down the center of the room and two lines along the sides. Which order he does this in is random, so just keep an eye on which one is first and which one is second. They mark the areas to explode after he hits them, and they will explode after a brief delay. Just dodge to where the second lasers hit, and then dodge into the safe spot after laser number one explodes. His next mechanic is also his most deadly mechanic in that of Diabolic Gate. Hope you did aim to pour hard mode. Diablo will deal moderate raid damage when he casts this, then reposition himself, shrink the safe space of the arena, and begin charging a super powerful line AoE through the center of the room. There will be safe spots 90 degrees to each side of it, but that's not the thing you really need to be concerned with. The AoE will be fired into a door opposite of Diablo and begin a chain reaction. Whatever door the AoE is shot into, it will come out of the other door of the same symbol. So if he fires it into a Gubu symbol door, for example, it will then be fired again out of the other Gubu door after a short delay and then into another door. This continues until all four symbols have fired an AoE. There are a few easy dodge patterns here, but you'll still need to identify which symbol is going where. It's very reactive, and if there's any mechanic in all of Dalryada that will kill people, it's this one. Consider using big shields or defensive skills just in case you take a hit, as the hit's not automatically lethal. After the fourth AoE, Diablos will do a donut AoE, so begin to quickly run deep into his hitbox after all the doors are gone. This finishes Diabolic Gate. The next mechanic is Magitech Bits. This summons a line of bits that fire line AoEs that you need to avoid. It basically hits two opposing quadrants of the room, so the safe area is pretty massive. It will be combined with other attacks later, including Etherochemical Lasers and even a knockback AoE from the center. You just need to do these mechanics on the side safe from lasers. That's all it's asking you to do. Then there's Advanced Death 4. This summons a bunch of expanding AoEs around the room that, if they explode on you, kill you. Big surprise, right? After the first set explode, a few of these will actually spawn under random party members, so you need to adjust away from any of those tiny circles before they expand. The last new mechanic is Etherochemical Boom. I say new, but this is really just an easy mode version of Ultima and Diamond Weapons Etherochemical Booms as well. Several pairs of orbs will spawn and tether together, slowly floating towards each other. If they touch, you're dead. You simply need to run into the orbs to detonate them before they touch. These ones do not hit hard at all. Even a singular player on any job or role can do this safely. Melee focus on the ones near the boss, and range grab the ones away from the boss. If you blow up one orb without blowing up its partner orb quickly enough, the remaining untethered orb will explode on the raid and give everyone bones. It takes a couple of these before it's lethal, but just don't let it happen. Just run around and blow them all up. 
With that, you've seen every mechanic up to about the 15% mark, just new combinations will occur. We already mentioned the matchstick bit combos earlier, and there's another one where there will be an extra aetherochemical laser fired whenever Diablo does it normally. So he'll fire two lasers, and then he'll teleport like 90 degrees in either direction, and then fire a third aetherochemical laser. This just kind of shrinks the amount of space that you have and gives you an extra explosion to think about. Nothing special. The fight drags on, you will see Diabolic Gates again, and Diablo will actually start to pair baited AoEs with the Tank Buster, which doesn't achieve anything except get you to panic, and hopefully the tank is the one who doesn't. At around 15%, Diablo will return to the north side of the arena if he's not already there, and channel Void Systems Overload. He will spam this attack over and over again until you finish defeating him. It deals moderate room-wide damage, summons several conal AoEs that appear in sets, and finally places acceleration bombs on players. These will explode if the player moves or performs any actions, even auto-attacking, when the timer reaches zero. Now there are two different timers you can get with acceleration bombs, regardless though you can employ a similar strategy. Stand in either the second or third conal AoE, it doesn't matter as long as it's right next to one of the first conal AoEs that appears. If you have a short duration bomb, do the bomb mechanic first and then dodge the conal AoEs. If you have a long duration bomb, you'll need to dodge into the first safe spot and then resolve the mechanic. Once the bombs are done, four players will get markers over their head that aim line AoEs in their direction. Just have them spread away from the party without hitting each other. Everyone else should stack together right in front of Diablo for a split damage line AoE that's placed on another random player. Once you've dealt with that, it all repeats until Diablo is defeated. Thanks for watching my guide to the Dalriada, the finale of the Save the Queen questline. After finishing the Dalriada, you can finish the story quest, and then you can even turn in your medal for proofs of metal. For every 20 million medal you get, you will obtain three proofs of metal, and these can be used to purchase honors. Honors are permanent buffs that will increase your stats in all Save the Queen zones, yes, even including Delubrum Savage. They provide either 5% health, 5% damage, or 5% healing per stack that you get, and they stack up to 10. It's a few hundred million metal in order to cap all of these out, but if you're planning on leveling Reaper or Sage, you're probably going to want the damage one at the very least because 71 to 80 Bojda zones are going to be pretty popular. And that's a wrap for the video. Keep an eye out. We will be doing videos on the critical engagements as well as the duels once I manage to actually defeat all of them. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, take care.